Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, Rachel and I will be talking with David Zabka, the detailing and fabricating product manager at SDS2 and the host of the Steel and Whiskey podcast about a variety of topics, including what structural engineers can do to improve their drawings for detailers and how technology can improve their communication between engineers and detailers and the benefits of keeping detailing under the same roof as design and engineering and more. I'm your co-host, Matthew Picardle. And I'm your co-host, Rachel Hall. Now let's jump into the conversation of the week. Before we dive in, we'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Now let's dive into today's episode. Hey, David. Um, it's great to be talking with you today. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you do on a daily basis? Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, first off, thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, being on the podcast here with you. Um, so I am I am a product manager for AllPlan. Uh, AllPlan has a number of different software technology products within the AEC space. So uh, I am a product manager specifically for SDS2 detailing uh, is is the product that I'm a manager for. So you know what that what that means. Uh, what is it? What is a product manager? What do I do on a daily basis? So it's a lot of interaction with our customers. Uh, with our sales staff, with our support staff to understand, you know, what it is that our customers need, what they want, how to improve their lives uh, when they're using our, our software. Um, you know, market research to understand industry te trends, technology trends, where's the market going, you know, where's it going to be down the road so that uh, we can make sure that our products uh, keep up with the industry trends and, and all that and make sure that, you know, we are prepared and, and not going to be left behind in, in that side of things. So, uh, awesome. yeah. And, yeah. And then just, just, just so our, our listeners are clear on that. Like who, who exactly are your customers? Yeah. So uh, our, our biggest target and our, our biggest customer base is steel detailers. Uh, so a lot of steel detailers, a lot of steel fabricators, uh, depending on, you know, some some steel fabricators employ their own detailers and, and have their own detailers in house. So in that case, you know, it's it's the detailers that work directly for a fabricator. But there's also a big market uh, where the fabricators are subcontracting that detailing work out uh, to independent detailers that run their own business or, or whatnot. Um, you know, so if Really, the end users are the detailers, uh, but we have to stay in touch with those fabricators a lot because really in the end, uh, the detailers are, are providing a service and um, deliverables that have to satisfy those fabricator customers. So it's a lot of understanding and, and working with the fabricators to understand the like the equipment that they have in their shop, right? So new trends in equipment, What's the equipment uh, doing? You know, what new machinery is, is coming out and does it have new capabilities and things like that that we need to satisfy? So, so uh, Rachel, Matt, what, what about you guys? Tell me, uh, this is a, I got to get to know you guys also. So what do you guys typically do on a daily basis? Sure, I can go first. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so for me, I'm the, I'm a structural engineer, uh, project manager, and what I do on a daily basis is essentially doing the design work uh, right now, attending meetings, but in terms of the drawings and how it relates to fabricators, uh, 
we, you know, we, we basically do the drawings for at least the structural engineering design drawings for those. So uh, lots of building design for me. I may, mainly do that, uh, the engineering work as well as the drawings and uh, attending coordination meetings. So for me, that's what I typically do on a daily basis. Yeah, so I'm an engineering supervisor for Simpsons Strong Tie, and uh, I work for a whole like Southwest region of the US. And um, so like, just because we seem to be focusing more on like the detailing aspects of things, in addition to a bunch of other things that I do all day long, um, I do actually work with our customers. So it would be like engineers, architects, end users, the installers, contractors. Um, and oftentimes we are asked about uh, let's say trickier connections that um, maybe are not so cookie cutter or straight out of the, the catalog. And so we have to kind of like, uh, you know, all get on, get together on, work together to figure out like, how can it fit? How will it still like meet the load demands? What are the load demands? Um, different things like that. And so we definitely get into like some, some teamwork in terms of like connection design and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. So um, Matt, a so a continuing trend since since uh you're on the engineering side and and talking about the design drawings and such this this fits in here um so something that our my customers our customers um as detailers and the fabricators continually kind of uh complain about and is a continuing trend is kind of just the quality of design drawings that they're getting from engineers um, it's just missing information, maybe incomplete uh, here or there, or sometimes a, a lack of understanding of how things are actually going to be built. So um, tell me a little bit, do you, what do you think some of the reasons for this might be? Yeah, I I think for me, at least in my experience, and you're talking to other engineers as well, with the engineering drawings for us, you know, we're, we're supposed to relay our structural intent for some of the connections, for example, steel connections. And I think some of us will we'll take that too far. We'll get a generic detail and say, yeah, we've got a detail. We got a schedule, uh, let the steel detail detailers figure it out. But then there's some really unique connections that really need, you know, the structural engineering input. And I think in terms of that part, yeah, there there may be things that the engineer may not be able to look at because not all not all structural engineering firms uh, work the same way. I think some of the more old school ones are going off of you know just two D drawings. They're supposed to envision the structure in three D and envision all the connections. And if they're just starting out or if they're just a few years in, they may not have that complete ability to know where all the details are, and and, and some other ones are doing the full 3D model where you're looking at the 3D model and then they're seeing, I, I'd say more of like uh, with the type of software, like the shop drawing software where they're they're modeling and seeing where all the connections are. Some engineers work like that too and they may be able to better spot those unique conditions or better details where, where they need it and see the conflicts. Mm -hmm. But I think that's where uh, some of it is coming from where you have a combination of newer engineers that are still under training and maybe something slips through the cracks or they're, they don't have the full 3D model in them and they're not used to seeing what the detailers are seeing. Cause I think with the detailers, they're, they're seeing each and every bit and they're seeing how everything connects. And hopefully the, well, the good engineers will know to look at that stuff too, but if they're still looking at it or they're still under training, the, that's some of the things that they can miss. And maybe that's some of the things that the detailers are, are pointing out as well. Yeah. I think that you bring up a really good point there, um, Matt, in terms of like 2D drawings versus 3D. And, and I think that's one of the ways in which like, you know, technology is just such a huge advantage. Like so often we see things um, at Simpson where it's like connector connections are, are like stacked and like, um, you know, multiple are called out and, and then when you actually look at like the the size of the wood member, it it all it doesn't fit, you know. But on like on a, on a two D image, it looked great. But in three D, it's <laughs> yeah. it just doesn't work, you know. So I, it, tell tell us more about that. Like how does how do you guys think technology helps? <clears throat> so I think um, 
I would say it, technology helps. It also hinders in some ways. So, and what I mean by that, so um, take uh, take some of the analysis and design uh, technology or, or software packages that we have today, right? So it's come a long ways and it, it's very advanced in, in doing certain things to analyze a structure, make sure that structure is going to stand up and, and that it's designed properly, all that. But where sometimes um, it can fall down is, you know, at the detailing level, it's not just about, okay, is this going to stand up? It's also about how are we going to connect this? How are we going to build it in the shop? And then how are we going to erect it on site? So those, that technology and those analysis packages aren't always considering that, which leads to problems downstream, right? So a great example might be sometimes, uh, those packages may have options to give me give me the the members with the lightest section that's possible, right? Well, lightest isn't always always the best because lightest might mean now with all the forces that get transferred to the end reactions, we've got to um, put a lot of stiffeners and we've got to reinforce that joint, right? So. Um, that costs a lot of money. It's hard to, for the detailing. And then that a lot of times stuff like that can result in sending information back upstream, go through the RFI process. Hey, you know, this isn't going to work. That's not going to work. Or just something as simple as like trying to support a, a really deep beam with a really shallow beam, you know, um, that creates a lot of cuts on the, the deeper beam that makes it really hard to connect and such. So um, technology is great. Technology is amazing, but we also have to make sure that we don't uh, lose the basics of the thought process and some, some of the fundamentals that go along with that as well, right? And I think maybe that you kind of asked for for how technology improves, but I went the opposite way and, and <laughs> went the how it how it hinders, right? Are, but, are you having uh, a tough IT day today? Like, <laughs> really a little yeah, bit negative yeah. about technology. Oh, I get it. I get yeah, it. I, I love technology, but um, yeah, those are some of the ways that that it hinders, I suppose. Um, yeah, I had. I guess my two cents on that too is. Uh, from the structural engineering perspective, a lot of our analysis software at the moment deals with, uh, you know, a lot with the, the main member design. Like, hey, is this beam going to sag or is it going to fail? Uh, if the so, and then oftentimes the connections are still clunky in terms of detailing design. Sometimes you have to export the forces into a separate program to get your nuts and bolts uh, calculated it out, mm -hmm. and it gets messy with the, the workflow and, you know, more workflows, more chances for mistakes, more things to pass through. And even with all the software that we have, it's, it's go, go, go. And, mm -hmm. uh, in a shorter time frame than they did back in the day where they could spend more time on buildings. Now, since, since with all the software, uh, I think the clients expect it to be faster, faster, faster. Cause we have all the software, which sometimes we can, but I think there's, you know, more moving parts, more, more prone to error and the more, more quality control and QC that we need to do as uh, engineers and uh, as detailers too. Yeah. Yeah. Time, but, uh, timelines. That's a really good point on the timelines because I think it's uh, yeah, they just want to push that information out and get it as fast as they can, whether, and sometimes that results in, oh, well, you pushed us too fast and then there was incomplete information and now we've got to go back and, redo it. And ultimately that usually ends up in a longer time frame at that point. It's just taking that little extra time up front, doesn't it? Yeah. I did have a follow-up question to, to the one yeah. I asked was, so there's in the West coast, is this true? I, I know I, I've heard. So in the West coast, the structural engineers from from what I see, we do all of the design connections. Like we'll tell you what the stiffener plates are, uh, how the bolts are going to do. But I heard in the East Coast that engineering work is done by other fabricators or detailers. Is that is that what you've been seeing as well? That's something I've heard that 
I haven't designed the East Coast, so <laughs> yep. that's something I've seen. So traditionally, uh, I think there's a line somewhere in the middle of the U.S. It's like probably about the Mississippi River, maybe. I, was gonna say, I, I think that's what it is. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. but um, it's probably not a hard line. I'm sure it varies from from different areas, but yeah, you get kind of east of the Mississippi. It's it's common practice for the engineers to design your main main structural members, and then they delegate the connection design to uh, the detailer or the fabricator. And then they become responsible for that, that connection design. So uh, our SDS2, we really, really excel in that market because we have uh, intelligent connection design built into our detailing software. And Along with that, so we do erectability checks. We make sure like there's enough room to to put bolts in the holes, things like that, uh, just to make sure that it's gonna be easy to fabricate in the shop and easy to erect in the field. Um, but then, yeah, on the the you get west of that line, and the EORs are typically doing all the connection design and, and providing that connection design, which. We can do that also. Um, we're 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 a kind of generic modeling software, but we've got just so happen to have really great connection design built into it. So, um, uh, yeah, that's. And then uh, when you look at international markets, also uh, there's a combination of the two types, also the delegated design or the EOR being responsible for it. I I think. It's a little more common for the EOR to be responsible for the connection design in the international markets. So I think it's uh, less common to see that delegated design, but uh, certainly see both both methods everywhere we go. So, yeah. Do you think that um, like dependent, I guess, upon like your, your location, like would you say that the engineers and the detailers have a pretty good understanding of what their role and responsibility is in terms of of the other person or do you feel like that's something that could use um some improvement um that's a that's a great question i i certainly think there's improvement I, and i guess i'm also kind of the type of person that thinks no matter how good something is there's always room for improvement right but um yeah there certainly is um and, you know, I think uh, both both sides kind of complain about about the other from from my perspective or what I hear. I think both sides complain about the others a bit. But what they don't understand is that one can't do their job without the other. And they should be kind of more, in my opinion, they should be more complementary of each other. Right. So um, engineer absolutely serves a great purpose. There, there's there's great responsibility that comes along with that. And they're doing all that math, all that analysis, designing the the, um, structure to figure out how they're gonna hold up the crazy design that the architect came up with, right? Um, But then the detailer is very knowledgeable and understands, again, how how does the shop build this thing? How do, how is this actually going to be erected? And um, one can't really complete the project without the other. So I, I do think that uh, everybody should, you know, take a little bit more time to understand one another and, and understand that, hey, they're, they're complementary roles. They shouldn't be, shouldn't be fighting against one another. They should be complementing each other. So right. Definitely more of a team, yeah. team aspect. They need each other yeah. to, to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So and I guess from your guys' side, um, I what do you think what do you think structural engineers should know about detailers and fabricators that could help in their designs? Yeah, on on my end. I think it's kind of the things that we've we've been talking about in terms of the structural of the detailers, what they should know about the engineers is they're probably not working on those. Uh, they're probably not looking at every nut and bolts uh, for every single connections. I 
I know on the engineering end, they try to save time by doing some type of schedule, right? Where, hey, here's a schedule of, of these different beam conditions. And if it's engineered correctly, that should cover all of them. But I think inevitably some weird corner or some weird connection pops up and it needs more input from the, the engineer. So I think with the detailing size, maybe the structural engineers may not be looking at it and yeah, they, they make mistakes. We miss, we make mistakes too. And some things can be missed, but hopefully in a good design, you know, a lot of those, those connections are being looked at. And I think also, uh, at, at least for me as a structural engineer, I, I really like it when I get a chance to talk to the fabricators, when we get on the phone or get on a call, it's like, hey, uh, the detailers can go, yeah, this is your drawings or this is your detail. You know, for us as fabricators and detailers, it'd be a lot easier to construct it if we changed it this way, because uh, maybe for their shops and fabrication, because they're the experts on that, obviously. So for us uh, as structural engineers, I think, like you were saying, if we can communicate better, get on the phone more, and get those things coordinated uh, that can uh, help the team out a lot because you know for us engineers we're, we're the ones not out in the field and yes we know a lot about the connections and whatnot but at the end of the day it's still the fabricators and the steel detailers that are coming up with those shops and the ones that are that are building it so yeah we don't know everything and hopefully most of us are <laughs> open to, to learning or <laughs> seeing what the field prefers that kind of reminds me of um, just, you know, like engineers, like, you know, my background in consulting too. It's like, you tend to kind of be in the office a lot and, you know, you're staring at your computer, you're staring at a set of plans. Um, I mean, I, I can't even remember how long ago it was, but I had an opportunity to go out to a steel fabricator, like, and walk through it, meet with people, see how it was done. And it's really eye opening. Um, I think like when you're in the office as a design engineer, you don't really see, you just, it's not that you're, well, you're not exposed to it, but you just, or me anyways I just didn't even think about it like it just didn't really cross my mind and um really similar to like Simpson also like we'll invite customers out to our our warehouses to see how our products are made and stuff and we kind of get the same reaction from most people that have never been out there they're like wow like we just we had no idea this was such like a big operation and things like that you know it's kind of it's just eye-opening so um Matt you kind of just touched on that about like just you know being more in tune with what they're doing and like maybe developing those relationships with them and all of that, it would lead to like a better, um, you know, design and product in the end. Right. Yeah. I know for newer, especially newer engineers, you know, they're spe specifying things off of their calculations. Like, Hey, you just specified a one and a half inch thick base plate. Do you know how <laughs> thick that is? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Like because sometimes we're just too involved in the calcs and yeah, you know, the fabrication part of it, or you know, going out to the steel fabricators and seeing what it's actually doing. I think that's a, a part of engineers that we should get trained in more, especially going out into the field. Well, and uh when you talk about technology, BIM especially. So when you're looking at the things like 3D models on your screen and you get a, a big, you know, a really big wide flange column or beam on there you're just seeing a little thing on a screen and it doesn't really translate in your brain a lot of times how big that thing actually is and then you go like you were saying then you go out to the fab shop and you can actually see that and feel it and and touch it and it really makes it come to life and and help you understand kind of the yeah, the, the the weight of the thing or or how big it actually is. So yeah, it it is very eye opening to to be in the shops like that. I I always enjoy. So in my role, I I do get to visit quite a few of those shops pretty regularly. So it's part of the job that I really really enjoy. So what are I guess yeah we kind of talked about some of the common mistakes, but um, if we talk about you know past the design talk about the shop drawing approval process. So this is a topic that has been uh, ongoing, I feel like in this industry for a long time is, is the shop drawing review process is, can be slow, it's tedious. A lot of them still do it by paper now. Um, some are adopting electronic 
you know, blue beam and being able to highlight and check drawings electronically now, but, um, what, what in your guys' minds, what's the most effective, most efficient, uh, process for shop drawing approvals? Yeah. On my I'll end. let you, yeah, you, you answer yeah. that one. So for me, it's, it, it's electronic. Most like 99% of the time it's electronic. We'll, we'll go through Bluebeam and that's how we'll do our shop drawings. Uh, so I guess more of the new school way, but I know there's even with technology, there's even uh, more things that you can do. So at least for, for the Bluebeam, I think that's great. I mean, it works and it's effective and it's simple. Uh, but I know there's talking to even different engineers and different firms too. And depending what type of project and how complex it is, there's even some, I'd say, I'd call it like 3D shop drawing where you help. You, I know you can do some scripts to kind of do some back checks on things like that. And even getting like a fabrication model, overlaying it with your, with your structural model. So I know there's more things that we could do, especially with tech technology that could help automate a lot of that. Uh, I don't know if it's, I doubt it's perfected yet, but it's going to be interesting to see what, what type of uh, shop drawing processes structural engineers come up with and in, in their review to, to help speed stuff up. Cause a lot of that is, what do you call it? Uh, checking the, making sure everything is checking out, right. Checking the sizes are right. Uh, detailing and the structural intent of the details. So I think the majority of that is kind of just, okay, yes, back checking, yes, uh, matching, which can kind of be repetitive. And to me, that seems like it could be scripted out somewhere, especially with 3D and and leaving the really critical details for the uh, structural engineer to to review and leaving the more mundane, repetitive stuff to uh, to to software, which. Yeah, we'll, we'll see where we're coming with that. I know there's all that new technology coming out. So we'll see what happens. Seems exciting. Kind of on that same like topic in terms of, of the review process. Um, I'm just curious what you guys would say in, in, in regards to like, are there benefits to keeping the detailing and the engineering like design portion of it, both of those underneath like the same roof? Do you think that that would help um in that like does that help in that review process or what what are your guys' thoughts on that i so um in in my opinion i absolutely think that could help so really at the end of the day what it what a lot of the things boil down to is just simple communication right it, it's the drawings are a way to communicate downstream to the detailer to go ahead and create a shop drawings, which are going to communicate information downstream to the, sh to the shop. Um, but then when there's questions, we've got to communicate, right? And um, the way, the way the construction industry has always kind of worked is, is um, they're a little bit segmented, right? So you've got general contractor hiring out the different subs and then you know, we're not always able to talk directly to one another. We a lot of times have to go through another party who I'm contracted with so that that person can go to another person to communicate to another person, right? So um, anytime, I think anytime that we can eliminate those barriers to communication can tremendously help things out. Um, you know, so if you think about, if things were under the same roof in the same house, now a detailer might be working in, uh, you know, the, the office next to the engineer. And all he has to do is pop his head in and say, hey, I have this question. Wasn't sure what was going on here. Can you help me out versus creating an RFI, sending an email to their contact who sends it to theirs, who sends it to theirs. And then they got to wait for them to answer and go through all the chains back through it. So um, talking about timelines earlier, you know, you can imagine how that can improve not just communication, but speed up that timeline and, and, and not just speed up the timeline, but do it in an efficient way as well. So. So you see organization organizations that are are 
functioning both ways, right? Like under under one roof and not. Mm-hmm. Um and and you 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 put up a good reason why it, it makes sense to have it under one roof. But why do you think that um why do you think that that ha- why why is that not the norm? Like what do you think is going on that prevents that from being the way that everybody does it? Um I think there's probably a number of things that that play into it. Uh, I I think the construction industry is getting better about adopting technology, but just historically, construction industry has been slow to adopt technology. Um, and, And it's just about the way that that companies have structured themselves to work, right? It's their, their specialty is engineering that's what they're good at that's what they're gonna do right and then uh, we'll we'll send the rest off to somebody else who specializes in this other thing but um and then to try to bring those together can be difficult in my experience uh what i have some of the things i've experienced when i've talked to companies who want to bring detailing So usually it's the engineering side coming to me saying, hey, we want to bring detailing in-house. You have a product, so show me your product. Let me see your product. Let's talk about it. And we do that and they say, well, okay, now we we got to find a detailer and we got to find the right guy who's experienced. However, I think sometimes they're undervalued. And then when a engineering firm or, or another company wants to go hire that detailer, they're not willing to pay the money for the experience that that person brings the experience and the knowledge that that person brings because they don't have, you know, the higher education or they're maybe not, you know, they're not certified or they're not licensed or whatever, but that doesn't mean that they don't bring a wealth of knowledge and experience. So um, I think that we should, and it goes back to a little bit of what I was saying before too, like we're, they should be, the roles are complementary to each other engineer can't you know isn't going to be successful without that detailer and and vice versa so um i really think they should be more complementary of one another and and start valuing the knowledge that this person has and that person has because nobody knows it all um so yeah just yeah understanding that hey we got to work together more yeah i think uh in terms of if let's say the uh, the fabricator with a lot of experience, they join a structural engineering office, uh, that could teach a lot of the engineers about practical stuff and vice versa, Mm -hmm. because I think there's that, that missing gap where a lot of the new engineers, it just comes straight out of school. And if they Mm -hmm. haven't done a construction uh, internship, they might not even know what they're, they're designing. Like maybe they've never even seen a concrete pour or, or something because they just been, you know, going to school. And then now we're asking these engineers to go design something that they've never even seen. It's kind of backwards. So I think the more we could bridge that gap between the practical and the ones with experience, uh, maybe that's one way to do it or just making them go out into the field more or or things like that. I think that's one of the gaps that I see it's, uh, for, for newer engineers is yeah, they don't see a lot of it. Yeah. And, and I would say that's, that's not just for engineers also that, that also applies to the detailers, you know, that went to technical college for uh, learn the basics, learn how to draft. Right. But they've never been out in the shop. They don't, understand how these parts and pieces are coming together like like we talked about the the size of things that they look they look small on screen but (laughs) they're actually really big you know so um just that yeah experience and knowledge and, and knowing and understanding what it is you're actually designing and what it is that you're actually building really is invaluable Software helps. I know like the 3D software, I've seen the, what was it the SDS, S2 software? Yep. Is that correct? Yeah, yep. I've seen things where it it helps out, especially if engineers don't know how to picture things in 3D yet. Just because mm-hmm. sometimes I've received the models and 
a fly through of it. And it's like, oh yeah, that's exact. It's even in coordination calls where, hey, per this detail, uh, it, it's looking weird, but then we just fly in and then, oh, there's all the nuts and bolts. Yeah, that looks weird. Let's figure mm -hmm. it out. So mm -hmm. I think in terms of uh, the technology, like that's one great thing about uh, communication on, on both ends and all team members is it's so much easier when everybody can see it and understand what the problem looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are there more ways, better ways, um, things that we can do to enhance the overall communication between for, for better outcomes? I mean, yeah, I think in terms of engineers and detailers, and I've always found it the most helpful when we can always just hop on a call and do that 3D view and walk through the RFI and work out a solution. Uh, I can't do that. I, like you were saying, sometimes there's, I don't know, uh, someone's contracted or whoever, but when we can do that, and come up with a solution together, like right there and looking at it, like, what if we do this? I think that's the best type of problem solving uh, besides just being right next to them, right? Uh, next to their desk and problem solving through that way. But I think having all parties or a good amount of the parties looking at it and problem solving, I think that's I think it's one of the interesting parts of the job and uh, software allows us to do that. Technology allows us to do that. And I do think, yeah, bridging that gap between the detailers and the engineers. <laughs> I know the engineers might may have trouble, I don't know, calling them up, but I think vice versa is uh, we get that connection and get that call together. It mm -hmm. solves everyone's problem so much faster than, you know, the 10 RFIs back and forth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's just, it's communication and I mean, mm -hmm. like they say, like, you know, the picture speaks a thousand words, like any kind of technology or anything that you can have to use to enhance that conversation, like the fly throughs that you're talking about and stuff like that. And I think it just, it makes a big difference, you know? Yeah. Rachel, on your end for the manufacturing side, uh, how does that, you have the engineers, right? And then you have the. I don't know. Are they detailers when you guys are doing and making the connections? Do you, yeah. Because they, they got to work together too, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like even just like outside of just our, our typical standard offerings, you know, like we get a lot of requests for special connections. And um, and yeah, that that's like a lot of it's a lot of coordination between like us as like the engineers at Simpson, the design engineers that are specifying these connectors on their projects. And then also with um our team out um that deal it's our specials team right they like they're doing 3d mock-ups and different things like that like can we punch it can we cut it do we have that right size steel um where will we weld how will we weld like all that stuff yeah it's it's all communication and mm -hmm. um we have found that pictures um are really helpful also like something visual, you know, because people think they're ordering something and, and it's, it's not what they think. <laughs> so, um, similar, you know, similar to, to what you guys are dealing with too. Yeah. Communication always key. And I, <laughs> it's funny. I, we, I, I, I agree that we always can use communication or excuse me, technology to help us communicate better but we, we that's what it all boils down to really in the end isn't it i mean we're all just communicating design intent or we're communicating how to cut this thing or where to put the holes or whatever it's just no matter no matter what the technology is it all boils that back to communication so it's yeah. interesting yeah Thank you. Thank you, David, um, for, for joining Matt and I today. Uh, it was yeah. a lot of fun talking to you. Yes, very good. Yeah, thanks so much. I know it was, uh, it's it's interesting to see the other side of things because I know as uh, engineers, we need to get out of our cubicles and, and, <laughs> and that's what I yeah. emphasize. We need a, it's, there's so much more to learn just outside of your cubicle when you go talk to people, talk to the, the tradespeople, fabricators, detailers. They got so much knowledge that all it takes out is a, you know, a reach out or a phone call and yep. in technology, we have it. So 
It's funny because I I feel like um, just on that same note, Matt, I'm just going to add, I feel like um, my kids are in elementary school, right? And I'm always like, field trips are so great. Like you can't miss a field trip, you know? And I feel like it just, it carries right on through to your career. Like if as an engineer, you know, a detailer, you have the opportunity to take a field trip, let's just call it a field trip, um, take it. (laughs) Because like you will learn so much just in that, you know, experience that then you just bring that knowledge back to what you're doing on a daily basis. And it just makes you so much better. I, I think uh, field, I think we should use the term field trip a lot more than site visit. Site visit feels very uh, grown up and boring. Field trip sounds much more fun, doesn't it? That sounds fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you're not taking site visits anymore. You're taking field <laughs> trips. <laughs> totally. Field yeah. Trip? And they're, they're educational. And yeah. 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 People should do them. That's that's going to be my preach for this episode. Go take a field trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I would just like to say also, Matt, I I, uh, I feel like uh, we kind of picked on engineers a little bit today, and and needing to know and understand what happens downstream a little bit more. But I I, I really truly believe it goes both ways because you know like you as engineers, you have your own struggles, you have your own things that you know and have to overcome all the time. So I, I think a, a better understanding from, you know, the bottom up detailers and fabricators understanding, hey, what, what does an engineer actually go through and struggle with? I think uh, maybe they'd have a little bit more compassion and and uh, patience sometimes if, if they would take the time to understand what they go through too. So um, yeah. yeah, or understanding it was like, oh, you know, they have a typical detail. They probably didn't look at this unique one. So yeah. Yeah. let's work with them on, on on things like that. Hopefully it doesn't, but, you know, mistakes <laughs> happen. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, thanks a lot, David. Okay, thank you both. Yeah, take care. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and our questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There, you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, as well as any links to any resources or websites that were mentioned during the episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.